Good afternoon, and um, welcome to the second of three library book talks this academic year. My name is Paul Glassman. I'm the director of University Libraries, and I'm thrilled to see all of you here. We debated what size room to use, and in this building, there are either small rooms or large rooms. So we opted for a large room uh, because last year we were kind of uncomfortable with uh, being at room size capacity. Uh, we're grateful to the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies, as well as to the Sforim Sale for their support of this program. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, speakers actually, I'd like to mention that the third of our series is coming up. Uh, it will take place on the Barron campus in Stanton Hall at 245 Lexington Avenue on Tuesday, April 9th at 6 p.m. And we will welcome uh, Matt Miller, who's from the Department of English at Stern College for Women, who will speak about uh, Walt Whitman and his book about that poet called Collage of Myself. So please consider joining us for that talk as well. Uh, this afternoon, I'm honored to introduce our speaker, who is Professor Ephraim Kannerfogel. He is the E. Billy Avery University Professor of Jewish History, Literature, and Law at the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies and at Stern College for Women. He's one of the foremost scholars of medieval Jewish history and rabbinic literature. He holds three degrees, a bachelor's degree, a master of arts degree, and a doctor of philosophy degree, all from Yeshiva University. Uh, he will introduce the book he recently co-edited called Scholarly Man of Faith, Studies in the Thought and Writings of Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, after which Rena Krautworth, instruction, uh, excuse me, research and instruction librarian, will interview Rabbi Tanner Fogel about aspects and ideas in the book. Would you please help me welcome Rabbi Ephraim Tanner Fogel? Thank you very much, Paul. I'm wired for sound, apparently. I do this as a living, but uh, some of these things, if you go over the time, they kind of give you a little jolt. I don't think this is one of those, but uh, we'll see. Uh, let me begin with some um, observations about Rav Salvechik's uh, intellectual makeup and scholarly proclivities, and we can then talk about the book that is the star of the hour. Uh, I certainly want to begin by thanking uh, Paul Glassman and Eleanor Roman to put in a lot of time uh, to organize this and everyone else, the whole staff behind them, staffs, to help make this event a reality, and it really is a great honor for me to be here. I think technically this is the second or third time I've spoken at the Sarum Sale, but this is certainly the most interesting venue and the nicest looking venue. You chose well, Paul, uh, and I thank all of you very much for coming. It's, uh, you know, say it's a rainy day, golf is not in, and spring training is not that much fun, but nonetheless, uh, I'm very pleased that you're here. Everyone knows, or at least I think they should know, that Rav Salvechik had tremendous respect and admiration for Maimonides, the Rambam. For the Rav, and there are people in the room who studied with the Rav, I think, for longer than I did, but for the Rav, there's certainly no more perfectly written, finely tuned work of Jewish law and learning the Mishnah Torah, and the Rav would spend hours and hours constantly expounding every single word and sentence in order to arrive at the Rambam's precise intentions at each point. Similarly, the Rav looked at Maimonides' Moran of Uchim, God for the Perplexed, and his Mishneh Torah, and his other works, to understand Rambam's philosophy of law and his system of philosophy more broadly. Uh, in the course of doing so, the Rav brought to bear all of medieval Jewish thought, and modern Jewish thought for that matter, I have to remember that Rav Salavechik did a PhD on the thought of Hermann Cohen, because that's sort of all they would let him do in Germany at that time. That was of interest to him. That's a whole other story that other people know more about than I do. But so he knew all of that too. Um, and uh, it was at his fingertips, just as the Jewish sources were, the medieval sources were. Uh, it's also very interesting. The Rav claimed that people who took notes of his shiurim and recorded them and have mentioned this a number of times. Um, that his grandfather, Reb Chaim Brisker, who was very well known as a major uh, Talmudist and, anal and, and a great analysis of, 
Talmudic and Jewish law. Apparently, the claim was from the Rav that Reb Chaim Brisk either had written or intended to write a commentary to Moran of Uchim as well, which really sounds quite amazing. And apparently, for grandfather and grandson, Reb Chaim and the Rav, halacha and philosophy could be treated and understood as what amounts to, if not an inseparable unit, certainly a very, very compatible unit. However, despite his great affinity and love for the Rambam, uh, Soloveitchik trumpeted early and often the greatness of all other uh, Rishonim, all those who were active during the same period in Jewish history, a very productive period in terms of both Talmudic interpretation and Jewish philosophy. Uh, in a famous passage, he said, in my poor paraphrase, that if we lost the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, if we didn't have the Rambam's major halachic work gone, we would be missing out on a tremendous uh, opportunity for analysis, halachic and literary, of this text and deep understanding. But, he said, the Rav, if we didn't have the corpus of the Balei HaTosfot, the Tosafists, who were active at roughly the same time in a different place, we would be missing many of the halachic structures and approaches that we depend upon at all times. And again, I don't want to analyze this quip or this quick quote uh, too far, but the suggestion is without the Rambam, we'd be missing a lot of fun, intellectual fun, and some very important concepts. Without the Tosafists, we'd be missing halacha, we'd be missing abilities to put together whole areas of Jewish law. And the Rav gave an example. As he put it, it was the Tosafists, and their style was different than Maimonides, who brought together Sukyot in Chulun and Avodah Zarah to create the rules of the Jewish kitchen. Uh, if not for that, conflating and organizing in the material the way that we did, we really would not have such an easy time or such a guided time in terms of dealing with separation of being dear or whatever question you have. Most of it, much of it, really comes from the Tosafists who put their fingers on two, three, four, five Talmudic sources that have to really be brought together, and they brought them together very, very clearly so that someone who wants to pursue that halacha will be able to do it in a very uh, efficient and a very knowledgeable way. So we had lots of great things to say about the Bali Hatoso. The Rav also marveled, that's the right word, at the work of Nachmanides, Moses ben Nachman, Maimonides, your Maimon, no, uh, Maimonides, Moshe ben Maimon, Nachmanides, Moshe ben Nachmon, it is a Greek suffix for son of. So this is a different son of Moshe, Moshe ben Nachman, uh, a different Moses, son of Nachman, uh, different century than the Rambam, but nonetheless, uh, roughly uh, Broadway, Similar period, uh, the Rav marveled from his youthful Milchamot Hashem. Uh, Nachmanides commented on Isaac Alfasi's Halachot. Uh, apparently, at age 18, he was when he wrote this work. Maybe he was 19, but it doesn't matter. It's unbelievable. Uh, and it's written in a very terse and packed style. Uh, that's the way it's printed, too. Little letters under a big text. And the Rav used to get very excited when he succeeded in deciphering every move that Nachmanides was making in this very terse uh, text. That was the rough idea of great fun. So Nachmanides was just wonderful. Uh, Nachmanides glosses to say for Hamitzvot, especially to Maimonides' book of the Mitzvot, where he classifies and categorizes, especially the Sharashim, the roots, the sort of theoretical and larger roots of the precepts. Maimonides puts them out one way. Nachmanides uh, critiques, answers, ads and so on, the Rav liked that very much. Um, again, loved it all. Uh, to Nachmanides' expansive chidushim, Nachmanides' Talmudic commentaries were voluminous, and he really takes a theoretical position on the entire sugya. The Rav was very uh, keen on that, and perhaps one of the part of Nachmanides' corpus that some of us may know best, his commentary to the Torah. Uh, again, I've heard lots of stories uh, from all kinds of people of all kinds of ages, about ongoing debates and disputes that the Rav had with the other Rashi Yeshiva here at YU. Uh, stories of people walking in the street on Shabbos and uh, uh, all very calm stories. There was no, no voices were raised arguing about what did the Ramban mean in this line in his Torah commentary. Again, for the Rav, this, was, this could go on for days uh, and apparently years and apparently it often did. If we compare, now that we have a little sense of the Rav in that regard, stress very little, um, because it's on me, so it's very little. Um, if we look at the Rav's intellectual and learning heroes, we look at Rambam and Ramban, Maimonides, Nachmanides, we make a comparison, 
um, I think we can learn something very important about the Rav's own intellectual makeup and breadth. On a certain level, Maimonides and Nachmanides are very similar, not just because they have the same suffix in the English names that we give them. Uh, both master the entire Talmudic corpus, vast amounts of classical rabbinic literature that accompany and form that corpus, um, and they consider this literature to be to undergird all of Jewish life and learning. And at the same time, both Rambam and Ramban each excelled in a vitally important, what we might call, borrowing a term really from Professor Torsky, Salvador of Son in Law, uh, extra Talmudic discipline, which they developed and pushed, pushed much further. For the Rambam, of course, that extra Talmudic discipline was philosophy. For Ramban, for Nachmanides, the extra Talmudic discipline was mysticism, Kabbalah. Uh, you'll say, well, these are very different disciplines. Yes, they are, but for all the differences, the overall program of these two we've shown and these two great medieval Talmuds and thinkers uh, was really not so different in terms of the big picture. Nonetheless, there is a fundamental difference in the way that these two great figures pursued Talmudic and Halachic studies and the rest of their Jewish intellectual interests. And I'm going to say things carefully. It's all being recorded so I can get in trouble. Too much trouble. Uh, Rambam was, in a sense, very picky. Um, and I'll tell you exactly what I mean. Even as his life began, just as the golden age of Spain was winding down, uh, the sort of majority opinion thinks he was born in 1135. There's a strong minority opinion that he was born in 1138, based on some findings in the Geniza documents. Um, I like to tell graduate students that uh, there may be a simple way to explain this. Dis disparity in dates. Uh, in 1985, there was a conference celebrating, a series of conferences. I was still before my doctorate, so I wasn't a real player, but um, there was a series of conferences all over the world celebrating the 850th year of the birth of Maimonides, born 1135, right? 1985. Uh, for all those various academics, some of them very excellent, who didn't get into those conferences, uh, they favored the Geniza reading that happened being born in 1138, so they can have another series of conferences in 1988. That's only partly a joke. In any case, um, <laughs> mostly a joke. Anyway, um, even as he lived, so 1135, 1138, just as the gold age of Spain is really winding down, the Amalhades really put a complete end to it in 1147, 1148, um, and maybe because of that, uh, the Rambam has chewed a number of the disciplines that the Golden Age liked a lot. For example, history, he says, has little use to him. Uh, why should we be interested in when a king lived or when a king died? Even though a sense of history, Rambam had a great sense of history. If you look at the beginning of the Chaut of Odazara, the Rambam does a tour de force based on rabbinic literature and his own sense of how Avraham recognized God, how he embraced monotheism. It's a historical narration there that's terrific. But for the Rambam, history books uh, were not the ones that, uh, that, that really got him excited. Um, and uh, the same thing is true uh, about poetry. Rambam wrote beautifully, very beautifully. Uh, but he says and poetry was a major uh, commodity in the Golden Age period. Jewish poetry, secular poetry, Islamic poetry, style that was barred, and so on and so forth. Uh, Rambam expresses little interest in or use for poetry. Again, never mind the secular poetry that had been popular in the Golden Age, even among some leading rabbinic figures, uh, no piyutim really from him or uh, for him or from him either. This was not something that he cultivated. Um, so that's a sense of sort of disciplinary pickiness. Moreover, the Ram was rather choosy, and this is okay, about his sources. Um, clearly, saying it very carefully, not all of the Gaonic corpus was to his liking, and the same holds true in Jewish thought. Uh, Kalam, and the thought of Rapsagi Gaon did not speak to him either. Uh, even with regard to general philosophy, Aristotle was, of course, in, very in, even in cases where Rambam thought that a work that was actually of Neoplatonic origin had been written by Aristotle. If he thought Aristotle wrote it, it was in. And he worked hard to jibe that not quite Aristotelian source, but the other sources with which he was working. So if it had a big A for Aristotle, Rambam was in. Not in a silly sense contrary, in a very deep sense. Uh, another A, Al-Farabi. If it's Al-Farabi, uh, it's in, in terms of Islamic thought. 
I could give you a list of those who are not so in. Uh, again, amongst Greek and Arabic philosophers, there were some for whom he had many, for whom he had seemingly very little use. So while there was no deeper a thinker or interpreter than the Rambam, in some respects, very carefully, he might not be considered so broad uh, as an, an intellectual figure. Uh, he limited his disciplines to those few that he mastered totally and beyond totally, and he limited his, his sources to those that he especially respected and trusted. And again, the lists are not all that long. So, you know, to put it sort of in kids' terms, you know, 50 miles deep, not that wide in terms of what he's taking in and what he's looking at to construct his movement. We go to Nachmanis on the other hand to Ramban, um, the, something different seems to be the case. Uh, Ramban sought to excel in a wide range of disciplines beyond Talmud and mysticism. Um, systematic, partial, tamikra, biblical interpretation, using different methods. Um, I often like to tell our Bible students that there is a great dissertation. Dean Berger, who's smarter than I, and tell them, tells them it's a life's work, because <laughs> he wants them to do it only if they really want to commit time, uh, is to go and figure out line by line, take Ramban's Torah commentary, go line by line, and indicate, based on research, obviously a lot of it is just him, but what are his sources? Is that line a Northern French source? Is that line a Southern French source? Is that line a Spanish source? Meaning, where does Ramban seem to be getting this particular approach from, or at least the beginnings of it? He had all of that material. He played with all of that material. Very rarely does he footnote. Uh, the medieval footnote policy was not our undergraduate plagiarism policy here at Yeshiva University, which is very strict for good cause. Uh, Torah was Torah, and everybody could sort of do what they want. Uh, if you think about it, Maimonides wasn't such a good footnoter either, right? He doesn't tell us his sources hardly at all. But that's left to everybody who's interpreting the Ramam. Uh, for Ramban, it's not dissimilar. Uh, there are whole sections of his Torah commentary, which are based on, not taken from, and not simply copied, but which really have as a base an array of medieval European sources, and the range is really uh, pretty great. Um, and, um, uh, and that's the way that Ramban does it. Um, in terms of sources, uh, Ramban also had all kinds of unusual disorder, the sources at his disposal, or at least of which he was aware, including some interesting non-Jewish sources. Um, the favorite of our late Revel Dean, Professor Arthur Heimenzahl, uh, was the Ramban at one point refers to the, the donation of Constantine. He knew a lot of stuff, and he was really very interested in bringing that to bear. Not that the Ram didn't know a lot, he did, but the Ram basically said, if it's not in my sort of wheelhouse, uh, it's not for me, I don't need to do it. And the Ramban, on the other hand, really sought to bring in material and to work with a wider array of material. And by the way, just for the record, this doesn't, you know, doesn't say anything more than what it says, but the Ramban composed a number of P.U. Tim. He was a poet, and apparently he did know it. Uh, and he tried his hand at that, because that's what, <coughs> so am I with this work. Apparently, um, uh, this was something that he felt important to do. Um, another kind of example, um, even though some scholars have argued that what I'm about to say is not correct, I think, uh, I think it is, and I think others have shown it very nicely. Uh, Ramban's mysticism, um, remarkably, did not get in the way of his pshat when he was interpreting a pasuk, a biblical verse, in a simple, straightforward way. He could use mystical concepts, and he was able to blend them. He was able to bring them both to bear, and he was able to do it without doing violence to the other end. Not that mysticism and straightforwardness are inherently inimical, but nonetheless, that's a pretty good trick. Um, and he was able to present on many occasions. I think the ones where it doesn't happen are a very small exception. Mystical interpretations that solve all kinds of, of shock problems, too. I'll just telegraph one example. I can't really do it now. So I have to have a question. But, um, his understanding of the Yehuda and Tamar story in Parshat Vayeshev, um, which clearly has a Kabbalistic concept at the center, the transmigration of the souls. That's why Yehuda wants his sons, or that's why Tamar wants to continue in the family, and that's the whole discussion. Uh, but in doing that, in getting that Kabbalistic concept centrally in there, the Ramban offers a pshat approach, and again, I can't take you through it now, but it's really very striking, uh, that's different than Rashi, and in many ways more satisfying um, at the same time. Um, so again, there's a Kabbalistic center, 
but the methodology is pshat, it's straightforward, it's simple, it's very clear in the psukim, it's very clear in the verses, it adheres beautifully to biblical grammar, right? there's nothing mystical about the method of interpretation uh, whatsoever. Of course, just to complicate this particular example, um, it's possible to show that Ramban took the basic interpretive structure, the pshat structure here, from Yosef Bahor Shor, who lived in northern France, one of the Bali Hatosvot, had no idea whatsoever of the Kabbalistic material. I don't know if he had any idea, he certainly wasn't interested in it. Um, and it's a case, again, where he borrows a method and he puts it in his way, keeps the Kabbalistic material in, and comes out with something really very striking. And again, uh, uh, you know, is something that somebody like Rashi didn't even think about in the way that he went about his interpretation. Bottom line, Ramban is able to bring together many sources all kinds of disciplines to make these larger and yet extremely precise arguments and interpretations. Um, one of the best examples I can give you of this is an academic example. Uh, Ramban wanted to teach in all fields of Jewish studies, wanted to be in all departments, but he wanted to be able to teach in the terms and in the language of each particular subfield or department as well. So that when the Ramban is doing biblical grammar, he's not going to start humming you some philosophical lines or well, when he's doing Talmudic analysis, he's not going to start telling you about some kind of behavioral issue, unless it's very germane to the Talmudic topic. He's right on the money that as you do it, he wants to be a, you know, that kind of professor, that rare professor. Uh, you know, today university professors even become you know, guys like me, but once upon a time, and then you can really teach in every department. That's what the Ramban uh, really wanted to do. Um, and um, uh, we also have to remember that for all his deference to his predecessors and sources, the Ramban shows great deference. Okay, not so much for Ibn Ezra, when he talks about Tochacha Megula, he's going to rebuke him. But remember, even about Ibn Ezra, he says, Tochacha Megula, I'm going to rebuke you openly, I'm going to challenge your method very frontally, but Ahavam is Suterit, I love you. So Ramban is very respectful, um, but having said that, uh, he's an intellectual slave uh, or follower of no one. Um, there's this great line, um, which I'm sure many of you know, in his introduction to his um, commentary on Maimonides' Sefer HaMitzvot, where he says there that he's going to question Maimonides, he's going to interrogate Maimonides, but he's going to do so on the basis largely of Geonic material. So he's sort of saying, I'm going to bring other earlier material that perhaps Maimonides either dismissed or chose not to use or went around, and I'm going to sort of interrogate the Rambam based on that, but after he tells us that, he says, uh, I'm going to be a slave to no one, and here he uses the phrase again, which apparently originates, and people who've done the work know this much better than I do, um, it apparently originates with a literary star of the Golden Age period of Shmuel HaNagid, it's also a no mean Talmudist he. Um, and the phrase goes like this, despite the fact that I'm going to bring Geonic material, lo ehyek chamor no se sarim. Literally, I'm not going to be like a donkey schlepping books, meaning I'm not just going to carry other people's books, as important as they may be to my thinking and presentation, I'm going to say what I think, I'm going to use my own ingenuity as well. So that's all of that, I think, in many respects, um, uh, helps us to understand the Rav, perhaps because he considered the Rambam completely unimitatable. Uh, the Rav saw himself, Rav Saladechik saw himself, I think, more in the mold of Ramban. Uh, Rav Saladechik's intellectual curiosity was remarkably broad. Uh, he had no time for Narishkeit, but anything that wasn't Narishkeit, that came from some kind of intellectual endeavor, he could think about. He might not spend a lot of time on it, he might reject it, but he could think about it. Um, and although Talmudic and Rabbinic Corpus and, of course, Tanakh and its commentators stood front and center in everything that he did, um, the, um, uh, uh, the Rav did all kinds of other things. He did philosophy. He did philology. Uh, did he know about not just Jewish grammatical works, but about all kinds of really, you know, boring and seemingly insignificant points of Hebrew grammar? The Rav knew it all. Um, he taught Christian philosophy as a comparative point in his revel courses. You know, get the rub in trouble. Uh, but he once came in, and these are boys that he had taught. These are boys. These are people now who, you know, it's like other events in Jewish life where 
but it's soon not going to have people who remember it having been there. In my day, the Rav didn't teach a Rav. I did. Rav was already not in Rav. Uh, that would be great. Um, the Rav came in one day. He was kind of teaching a course on creation. Um, in the afternoon in Revel. And by the way, in the morning he conducted himself as a Rosh Hashiva, and a Litvish Rosh Hashiva. And I had the Rav, was after a series of difficult events in his life, he was in his early 70s, he was a sweetheart, they say. Oh, he could scare the life out of us in one fell swoop. When he called your name on the roll, you're already scared. And when he asked you, when he asked you questions, you just went under the desk and prayed a lot. But um, he was much calmer. So in the morning he teach Talmud and he'd have these young men, you know, standing on their heads and spinning around. The afternoon, he would come into the Revel classroom, and he was supposed to be a professor of philosophy. So all of a sudden, the fellow in the morning who couldn't get anything right, what do you think, Mr. So-and-so, just like a good professor of philosophy, I mean, even down to the way that you teach. But in any case, he came in one day, and he announced to the class, today we're going to learn about Oregon, church father, Oregon's theory of creation. <laughs> and he said to them, I want you to know I studied this very carefully, and I think I know it better than the Christians. <laughs> That's just the rough saying. I don't know if he really thought that, but that's his way of saying I put in a million hours. I looked at this extremely carefully. I try to get all the nuances, and now I'm going to see if you guys can understand anything that I'm saying. I'm sure some of them understood something. In any case, um, the rough knew history quite well. In fact, he seemed to know everything. Um, and um, that's even the Kabbalistic slash Tanya side of the rough. Uh, the rough, as is well known, had a a Hasidish teacher when he was a little boy, and he taught him some Hasidus. Uh, and the Rav knew the Zohar very, very well, and only the Rav, at least the way I you know, conceive of it, could use the Zohar to explain a difficult Tosfot or a Tosfot that needs work. Again, I can't give you all the data, but it's really quite a bridge to use a Zoharic concept to explain a Talmudic legal concept. In this particular case, it's Rabbi Tom's framing of the Tanaitic dispute that the world, the argument is, was the world created in Nisan or in Tishrei. And Rabbi Tom essentially says that the Almighty thought about creating the world earlier, but it sort of came to be at the later date. So it's a whole way how do I analyze that? The roof suggested that this is best understood by invoking the Zoharic concept which distinguishes between the revealed world, Alma de Isgalia, and the more sublime hidden world, Alma de Iskasia. Um, it's a remarkable interpretation, and Frank, I don't think anybody else could get away with it. Just really remarkable. Um, all one has to do to appreciate what I've just said in very clear terms, clearer than I've made them, is to look at my colleague David Schatz's piece in Scholarly Man of Faith. The reason that you're here, not here for me, we're here for the rough, but Scholarly Man of Faith, a book that we edited uh, Christoph Schwartz, and I'll come back to that in a second, um, which David Chance's article is a remarkable summation, but it's more than that, more than just the analysis that's been done, it's really an agenda for sort of trying to understand the rub moving further. And what you get, just from looking at that article, is the breadth and the extent and the categories and the pieces and the intellectual energy that the Rav covered in his uh, studies of all of these areas. Uh, and this uh, essay, by the way, treats only Jewish thought. We should have one on Talmudic studies. We could, we could have five or six essays, and people would look at them. If you took the names out, and people would say, well, who, who, what person did that? It was the Rav. And, you know, we saw it. We didn't understand it. We didn't appreciate it sufficiently, but we saw it. Um, and so this remarkable uh, breadth of interest and complete mastery in what seemed to be all areas is really part of, a significant part of what inspired uh, my colleague, Professor Dov Schwartz of bar -Ilan University, a very distinguished scholar of medieval philosophy and of the philosophy of the Rav, uh, and me sort of following him along to organize a joint conference between Yeshiva and bar -Ilan. That's how these volumes, um, we in the academic business like to say, great volumes always come out of pretty good conferences. Uh, this is a very nice conference. It worked out very, very well. We had one day here in Yeshiva, home and home series. One day at Bar Ilan. I must confess, full disclosure, only Professor Schwartz and I had the privilege of being at both, but nonetheless, it was quite a wonderful time. We heard some excellent papers right here across the street in New York that weren't prepared for publication despite our urgings, beggings, and so on. The one about the Rub's use of mystical teachings was particularly fascinating, but if you just look at the titles you know, in the book, um, aside from Professor Schatz's Ma'asayf L'chol HaMachanot, this tremendous uh, bringing together of so many things, um, you begin to get an appreciation for the colossus that the Rav was. Uh, Rabbi Shalom Karni's analysis of one of his 
philosophical work sort of released posthumously, um, and a rather unique one at that, The Emergence of Ethical Man. The influence of a Yudah lady on the Rav's thought and biblical interpretation as described by Dr. Shira Weiss. I'll say a little bit more of the Rav and Halevi later. Rav liked Halevi an awful lot. Um, he considered him to be a great Tamid Chacham and a great thinker. Sounds a little familiar. If you were a great Tamid Chacham and a great thinker, the Rav liked you first and asked questions later. Uh, but he asked questions. Uh, Alex Student's piece on essentially what amounts to emotion in the thought of the Rav. Just listen to the subjects. I mean, wow, really? Um, Professor Daniel Reinhold's assessment, rebel colleague on the Rav's use of scientific method, which has been discussed over the last four decades. Again, we're still now first beginning to understand what the Rav really thought. And my own piece on the Rav and the keynote, Tisha B'Av Lamentations. Uh, and the purpose of that piece is not simply to say what everybody knows, that the Rav again knew keynote and piyutim very, very well. He had a remarkable command of that literature too, um, and he judged these liturgical poems to be a tremendously important source, an excellent source for Torah study, thought, liturgical analysis. As he liked to point out, Tosvot cites and analyzes Piyutim on quite a few occasions. Uh, and quite frankly, as we've heard today, as I've said before, uh, if it was good enough for Tosvot, it was certainly good enough for the Rav. Uh, but that's not the key. The key is that the Rav used his uncanny understanding of the keynote of these Tisham of Lamentations, which again are devoted to such a difficult subject, and he explained it all so clearly. But then, in the middle of everything up, and everything else, um, he used it to come up with a whole history of the period of the Bali Hatosfot, of literature that's been lost, things that took us academics about 30 years to figure out based on manuscripts. The Rav had it all figured out. It took a while for me to figure out that he had it figured out, but the Rav had it all figured out a long time ago. So at the end of my time, let me just sum up as follows. Um, the greatness, the mastery, the understanding, the deep knowledge, and the command of texts of multiple, even myriad disciplines. Uh, when the Rav used to tell us to prepare something for the next day, prepare the Tosfot for tomorrow, he never told us the page number in the Talmud. You know, it's a big thing amongst Talmudists. Page four, part two, you know, line seven, you know, uh, uh, column one. Didn't do that. He, knew it. he had a remarkable memory. We still don't understand. He had a remarkable memory. He would always say, prepare the Tosfot that speaks about topic X, Y, or Z. You know where the Tosfot is because you've learned it. Not because you remember it. Anybody can remember. You have to learn it. If you learn it, then you really know it. That was sort of the, the uh, affect. And I guess as I come to the very end here, let me just say, and this is going to be a little funny. I don't know what they know in the Spartan sale, but there, there is a second volume. <laughs> You'll say, what? There is a second volume. Um, there is a Hebrew volume that was, I have a chance here to thank Yeshiva University Press for publishing this book, along with Urim, who did a great job. This is actually the second book that I edited this year. Uh, um, the other was a book in medieval Jewish studies. I uh, worked with a very excellent press. Oh, they were such pains in the neck. Uh, Urim were terrific. They did a marvelous job. I shouldn't say that on the tape, but anyway, they did a marvelous job, and they did everything well. Um, but that book, I'll just give you the title, and you'll have, again, another interesting sense here. Manhigud Ruchanit Bedor Tapucho. Professor Schwartz and I called that religious leadership in a challenging or turbulent time. That book and the essay, completely different essays. The introduction is a completely different introduction. And the introduction, in a word, says religious Zionism in the state of Israel has started to turn to the Rav because he is one of the few people whose philosophy was so sensitive and so reasonable that it could be used to try to solve some of the really insoluble and exceptionally difficult problems that people have in the state of Israel. You know, here you get parking lot either, it's no problem. I'll send you upstairs, downstairs, get in the parking spot, it's not that hard. And Eretz Yisrael, Midna Yisrael, there are real, real, real problems, of course we have them too, but really problems that are intractable. And they in Israel look at the Rav in the modern Orthodox world as a possible key because the Rav's ability to not be uh, decisive to the exclusion of possibilities. Here's what you should do, but consider, continue thinking about this. It's a paradox, so therefore we'll try something else. That kind of flexible, not flexible eclectic, but flexible thought and deep thought really speaks to them. So for all that you can see in this 
uh, nice blue volume. That, by the way, has the same picture of the Rav. It's a great picture. It's green. I don't know. It's not easy being green. But anyway, that's a green volume. Um, so I encourage you to uh, have a look at that, too. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, the first thing that you do after the conference is everybody sits around and says, we, we told people we wanted to publish it. The first thing you do is people complain a lot. I can't have it until now. I can't have it until now. I'm joking only a little bit. Um, we actually uh, uh, decided, and it's interesting, uh, as in all academic work, there are often called referee journals and non-referee journals, right? You have you publish your article in Journal X. It's a very nice article, but who's read it? Maybe the editor. Because these are, this is a university effort, and it's both Yeshiva and Bar Ilan, we went with the, we consider it standard, but we went with the high standard. We actually sent the articles that were presented to readers, and we got some very interesting comments. So that does two things. Number one, well, it does several things. Number one, it, you know, and this is not just boring academic stuff. I think there's a certain value here in understanding how to try to produce scholarship, even for the, the broader audience. Number one, obviously, if there are mistakes, those will be weeded out immediately, but more importantly, is this something new, is this something important, exciting, and so on. But if you send things to the right people, you get their suggestions, perhaps take this out, add something else, think more about this. And we were very blessed because we paid these readers a lot of money. Um, that's the academic way. And um, they're wonderful people because, again, it promotes the field. We got back some terrific reader reports, uh, and we were able to send back to the authors um, I, as an editor, got a reader's report or two, and you know, they kind of liked it, but uh, they had some suggestions, and we took those suggestions, um, and um, we put it together. So it, it you know, the, the notion also, that these sort of bar Ilan, this is before uh, President Byrne was on the scene, but he loves these relationships between Israel and America, and we do too. Um, it was a natural fit. Um, I will say that Rav Armlich, Zin Zatzal, was at the bar Ilan conference. He actually gave a talk. He wasn't in a position to publish, but he gave a wonderful talk on the Rav's halachic thought that only he could give, and that just sort of, you know, as I said to someone, well, we can go home now, we've heard something that will last us for the day, uh, and then there were a bunch of papers behind that that were quite excellent. So, uh, you know, it's like everything else, if you put a little bit of effort at the beginning, you hopefully get out a good result at the end. That's great, thank you. Um, I guess moving on, then you were the one that wrote the introduction. Um, well, the two of us. Well, the we, two of us, yeah. the two of you together, you and Joe Schwartz. So, um, but within the introduction, you talk about Rav Salvechik's approach to modernity. So I was wondering if you could spell that out and how it plays out throughout the rest of the book. Right. Well, so, so uh, as, again, as is very well known, Rav Salvechik was not afraid of modernity. Uh, he didn't embrace modernity. He thought about modernity, <coughs> meaning he embraced it his way. Um, and so the Rav's, uh, again, there are people here who can speak to this perhaps better than I, but the Rav's feeling was we live in the world today, not 200 years ago, not 500 years ago, not 1,000 years ago, and therefore our Jewish learning, our values have to be current and have to be uh, something that can speak to people today. Having said that, we cannot change an iota of that which should not be changed. And so the Rav had this wonderful way of trying to figure out not just what's in, what's out. The Rav was not a uh, thumbs up, thumbs down type of person, right? The short answer took, could take an hour. Um, but very deliberate. Um, if you look at the, uh, well, I, I, actually it's not true. I was saying all the articles are modern except mine. Um, uh, there are two. There's Yudal Levi and my sort of uh, keynote article, which focused on the medieval world. Um, although, again, the Rav used the keynote as much to talk about the Holocaust and about the implications of such things as anything else. Um, but there's an awful lot in this volume and in the Hebrew volume where the Rav really takes on uh, um, uh, you know, issues, burning issues for orthodoxy today, modern orthodoxy, and so on. Um, in some ways, I, well, you should buy this book anyway. In some ways, the Hebrew, go buy the Hebrew one too. The Hebrew one, I, you know, again, uh, our deal with the time, they, it's okay. She will make all the money, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, in some ways, the Hebrew volume really has some uh, almost, I wouldn't call it painful issues, but some really hot modern issues. But again, the issue of ethics, the issue of science, these are 
all issues of modernity. And you know, you can read these articles, then read another 25 by the Rav, and you have them in the various, you know, get David Schatz's uh, uh, bibliography. And if you like something, you can follow it right out, um, and you come out with a whole world approach, or at least the Rav world approach. Great. Um, and also, similarly, like you mentioned Zionism, but maybe you could spell out more directly. Like so, you know, the, the amazing thing about the Rav, the Rav spent about I, I, you know, four and a half minutes in Israel. It had to do with, with you know, economic, social, political, and religious, above all, pressures and issues. Um, uh, there are all kinds of stories about you know, the Rav's relationship, but there it's the Rav loved Eretz Israel as much as anyone, if not more. And the, despite the fact that he never lived there, although he sent a large part of his immediate family, um, uh, you know, the bulk of his grandchildren uh, growing up in Eretz Israel, the vast the majority of great-grandchildren and all of that. Um, the Rav understood that this is a modernity problem too. What do you do with Israel that you didn't have before? You didn't have it. Or you had it only at ridiculous cost and, and just un, almost insurmountable odds. Now the cost is still great and the odds are still difficult, but they're hopefully surmountable. Um, and so the Rav it, it was able, that's just the power of his mind and his heart, he was able, he's able to speak to religious Zionists here and there. Um, by the way, I think he can speak to not such religious Zionists here and there uh, of what are the key issues and how do you try to address these issues. Uh, you know, the Rav in his writings and his speeches talked about everything from land to land for peace. Who makes these you know, stuff, what we would call sort of the nitty gritty, to what is one's responsibility even in terms of going to Israel. And again, here's the Rav who didn't really live there, but he could talk as dispassionately about what, how one should think about it um, as you can. I just have to give one why. You know, the Rav had these great, you know, the Rav had a great sense of humor. So he's dealing with these tremendously complicated, difficult, and sometimes painful issues. <coughs> And he didn't make jokes when he wasn't supposed to, but he's a great sense of humor. So uh, when uh, going to study in Israel, you know, now today, students at Yeshiva University, uh, the vast majority of them spend a year in Israel after high school studying. You know, now they call it a gap year. I wish they wouldn't call it that. And I was like, gap year sounds like you got a year to play around. No, no, it's very important. But anyway, uh, be that as it may, they asked the Rav, who was just sort of starting in the, in the 60s, the 70s, this, you know, sort of more come after, after, since they were, of course. Um, and they asked the Rav, they said, you know, the Talmud says, Avira the Aretz Machkim, the land of, uh, the, the air, the environment of Israel makes, you know, makes you smarter. Um, so should they go now, you know, should they study here? So the Rav said, first of all, the Rav pointed out the word Machkim, here comes the philology. Uh, the Seder's coming up. Chacham is someone who's smart. What does the word mean? The word Lachim means to sharpen. You develop, you sharpen, right? So Avira the Arts Machim, he said, doesn't mean that the, the, the environment Israel makes you smarter, right? But that's not what it means. It means it sharpens what you know. So he said, you will come to my shir, you will come to my class, I will teach you, and he I had no, his ego was like this, but I will teach you, then you will go, they'll sharpen it. But first you should learn here with me. Uh, that was his, you know, again, that's not a, a Zionistic, that's not an assessment, but that was the rough trying to explain. In other words, you're a, you're a young kid at this point. You're here learning. Keep learning a little more. We'll send you out. We'll let you go. But, you know, bring something when you get there. Don't come, you know, hello, I'm here. Um, and, and again, so it was said as a kind of an off-the-cuff, you know, and he gave his big smile because he knew he said a funny thing, and it was good, you know, good joke. But a um, little humor. Um, but, uh, well, he always injected humor because while he was sort of torturing you with his knowledge, he would give you a breather by injecting a little bit of humor. Uh, the first time the Rebbe called me in Shira, I was about 17 years old, he called him, all the new guys, he would call the new recruits. He had a list of 100 names in the class and 25 names of guys sitting in. I'm digressing, but it's worth it, you'll see. And he, uh, he had six attendance monitors, he insisted on calling all the names, I think because he wanted to know who's in the class. He also signed all the smichas, he wanted to know who, who are these guys, you know? <laughs> some of them I know, some of them I don't know. Anyway, and he would call the names. Um, he was the only one who could pronounce my last name right. He pronounced the Kanar Fogel, as Europeans and Israelis do, so he didn't get all fouled up with the A is the American pronunciation and all that. Anyway, uh, the first, he calls my name, and he knows the new guys are here, he wants to see who they are. He says, where are you? Stand up, fine. He says, first of all, shorten your name. Ho, ho, ho. Read the Gemara. You know, that was his way of sort of making you feel good. Somebody said you should tell him Solomon H, because no 
bargain either. I said, I'm having a complete you know, blackout here. You talk to him. And uh, as his one was, he then asked you know, about 18 questions, 20 questions. It was a question 18 that I think I just you know, almost lost consciousness. Guys are feeding me answers. You know? And I, I remember the questions. I remember, the, I remember everything about that day. I was, I was wearing. You can't, you can't forget this stuff. Uh, he says, okay, good. That's enough. You know, off the hook. Breathe. Uh, the next day he calls the role. He says, come on, folks. You may not always remember the Gemara, but I will always remember your name. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Anyway, that was the rub. In the midst of, in the midst of, you know, it was serious business. If I didn't give a couple of answers there, he would have said, what are you doing here? You know, we would have probably said, somebody get him, you know, send him the other way. But that was the rub. It was serious business at all times with a sense of humor, which was just really remarkable. Anyway, not what you okay. asked, but... That. Glad that I survived, that's correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, I guess just two more. So, first of all, so in the article specifically that you write, you talk about historical detail, but you say that Ross Alvechek didn't really focus on historical details. So I'm just wondering more about why. So, so again, I, I suspect, as I said in the article too, the Rav knew history perfectly. The Rav peppers all of his keynote stuff, events in World War II, and not just the Nazi atrocities. He gives you Chamberlain, he gives you the negotiations, he gives you World War I history. He knew it. Uh, I don't know when he read the newspaper exactly, but he read it. Of course, he remembered everything he read, so it was no problem. I don't know if it's because the Rambam said, you know, we don't really care when kings lived or died. You know, not in, in, a, in, a, in a shallow sense, but the, the Rav was very interested in producing, whether it was philosophy or whether it was Torah study, something that would not be only good for the 1970s or the 1820s or the 1510s. It had to be universal. That was his approach very, very much. It's universal, not that nothing changes, but you know, there's no fun in saying, oh, I have an answer, things are different. For the Rav, that was a terrible answer. No, the basic halakha construct is the same. You've got to figure out what's moved. So, so the Rav, again, he's more of a philosopher than a historian. Um, it's, it's, um, uh, so it's not that he wasn't interested in history, it's that he wanted to, as I said in the piece, he didn't give us biographies of who he was citing, that was your problem. And in his famous you know, story, when I start teaching, my the, you know, Rashi walks in, my Maimonides walks in, the, all the great sages come into the room, my grandfather comes in, these people lived a thousand years apart. Didn't matter, as far as the Rav is concerned, each one of them could sit at the same table and you know, discuss this, and if they couldn't, it meant there was something wrong with what he was teaching. So even as he was aware of what was being added in the centuries, he wanted something that would be, I think, again, not universal in this kind of, yeah, everybody does everything, but that would really speak to all these generations, I think. That's an interesting um, you know, explanation. That's my best, my best guess. About, um, about his thought. And then also, so Dr. Schatz's article, he's talking about how this book in particular addresses previously circumspect issues that maybe, so are there more? Do you think? Oh, there are more. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I throughout the top 10, one of the things Professor Schatz was trying to do in his, in that big summary was not just summarize, but show where there's more room to go. Uh, listen, we're in a funny situation. We now have, uh, so many years after the Rav's passing, we now have a tremendous English language cachet of, of works that cover all kinds of Jewish thought issues, more popular, more esoteric. Um, what people don't realize, and we've got some great uh, summaries, uh, more than summaries, really renditions of his Talmudic teachings. The Rav taught Gemara hours a day, not every day of the week, but hours a day, many, many weeks of the year, nonstop. And he could go two, three, four, five hours at a clip without even looking winded. There have to be, again, I'm going to get in trouble here. There are, there have to be tremendous resources just of his rabbinic interpretations that we still don't, don't have published. And I, again, it's interesting, his grandfather, Chaim Brisker, who was his favorite hero of all, maybe, uh, it was only 50 years or so after his death that Chaim's magnum opus, uh, his uh, chibur, his composition on Mishnah Torah came out. I suspect that somewhere along the line here, somewhere, I, and I, I'm not trying to be uh, devious or mysterious, I don't know, but somewhere along the line here, a, a, a dump truck is going to back up, maybe to the library, and they're going to say, 
here are a bunch of manuscripts. Here's the stuff that the Rav taught. Now, I don't know if he wrote it all up. You know, because the Rav didn't publish because he was a perfectionist. And it's true, the Rav wrote much, he wrote lots of things, but he wrote much less compared to the volume of what he produced. Others wrote it, others edited it, he looked at it. Um, I think we're in for a, um, I hope, anyway, I'm, you know, as you see, I'm still like, I'm now back to being 70 years old, uh, which is good, because I'm about 103. Um, I hope that, the, um, that, that we're waiting for this truckload of these uh, Talmudic teachers. You'll say, but a lot of people won't understand it. If they'll study, they will. In other words, and this and this will be completely unimitatable, unprecedented, and unlike anything else we've got. So that's my hope. Okay. Well, hopefully that will continue. You share my um, hope. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I think now the audience, if anyone has any questions, uh, questions, folks, don't be afraid. They would like to ask. I mean, I have more questions than anyone. Okay. Okay. It was so clear, I don't know. It's hard to talk about the Rav because everybody has a different take. There are people here who study with the Rav. There are people here who never saw what the Rav looked like. Um, um, you know, although he was very, it, it, the Rav would come into, when I had him, he was about 72 years old. He had been through, again, personal tragedies and, and illnesses. He would start to teach. He would, he would kind of shuffle in. Um, uh, he had all kinds of guys with him, helping him. And he was, you know, a full command, but he would start teaching. And about 10 minutes in, he would be yelling at the top of his, not at the top of his voice, but he would be teaching, uh, throwing fastballs 106 miles an hour. He forgot he was not a youngster because he got into it so much, he was just transformed. And he would go like that for an hour or two or three. At the end of the hour or two or three, he would sort of sit back, um, Sometimes he would give, I have no other word for this, what I call, what we call a krechts, he would give a groan, a sigh. We got nervous because sometimes those sighs were real deep. Oh boy. He was going back to being, and you know, again, he, he was not a young 72. He had been through Europe, he had been through a lot of stuff. Um, and we were just amazed. We, when, during, when he was pitching those fastballs, uh, so the first thing you learn from the rub without even hearing a word from him was mind over matter. If it's important, you should be looking at it. Forget everything else. You don't know where you are. You don't know what you are. You're not 72. You're not tired. You're not. You're thinking. And uh, that that effort, uh, you know, color everything. But anyway, if you have questions, folks, I'm happy to take them. Please. You alluded to the book referring to issues in Israel today that are different than mm -hmm. in the past, in particular the issue of Kairos. Oh, so you know, it's the old problem. If we had the people who handled these things before, could say Rav Cook, could say the Rav, you know, name, name a few of the greatest all-stars we have, somehow I think we'd be in better shape. Um, you know, that's the problem. We don't have them, so we have to rely on, you know, and by the way, the Rav is very interesting that way. Uh, you know, the Rav was the rabbi's rabbi. Rab Bonin would call him up and he would answer questions and he would get questions from rabbis out of town and in town and in very orthodox synagogues and, in le and he would answer all of them and he would sometimes give them different answers, which in America doesn't work so well because it's, you know, we're democratic and we get the same vote. But in the Rav's way of thinking, there were different approaches, different possibilities, and you give the best answer to the person on the spot with all, considering all the factors. You know, someone like that will get the right answer every time. But even though the Rav did not like to decide that, the Rav, the Rav would have preferred nobody ask him anything. Because he was so, he, for himself, he was so, every, every position was right according to the Rav. That's why people say, Rav used to change his mind. He didn't change his mind. Every year he thought about it again. Last year position A won, this year position B won. How could that be? Because he rethought it. But that kind of flexibility, I, uh, and that kind of, of knowledge, I wish that, you know. Now, by the way, sometimes people would ask the Rav a question and he would say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Even th but even that was an answer. You know, in other words, uh, so it's, uh, what would the Rav have said? I don't know. We'll have to ask the Rav and he's not here. That's, that's a sad note I wish to end. But I <laughs> I'm sure Rabbi Knarpel will be happy to take questions individually. And sure. Uh, please help me thank both for your crowd work and rather than trying to come out